Welcome to Climate Channel, Climate Conversation with Kamrul Sodri, episode 61. In this episode today, we are going to discuss the 50th anniversary of United Nations Environment Program, UNEF, which was created in 1972 after the landmark 1972 Stockholm Conference. So this year, we are also going to celebrate the 50th anniversary or Golden Jubilee of Stockholm Conference. After Stockholm Conference, we have seen the creation of not only United Nations Environment Program, but also many events flowed in, especially the Environment Front and also Sustainable Development Front. In 1992, we have seen the Art Summit in Rio or Rio Art Summit. Then Rio Plus 5 in New York, Rio Plus 10 in Johannesburg and Rio Plus 20 again in 2012 in Brazil, Rio again. And also we have seen in 1992, the creation of framework convention on climate change, desertification, and also biodiversity. And many other conventions, Ramsar convention, then also Rotterdam convention, Stockholm convention, many other conventions and also protocols are created. So what are the milestones we have achieved since Stockholm Conference in 1972, 50 years back? 50 years down the lane, now we are here in 2022. What the planet would look like in next 20 years, next 50 years, we would like to discuss those issues, those milestones, those achievements, and also challenges with a very diversified panel today, which include Ambassador Franz Ferris of Switzerland, who has been in this process for many years, Professor Felix Dorfs, another distinguished friend of mine, who have been in this process for many moons, Professor Maria Ivanova, who has written a book on United Nations Environment Program and UNEF Asia Pacific Regional Office, uh, say Mazahul Alam, hmm, who is going to represent the United Nations Environment Program today. And also we have Professor Abdullah Shibli of Boston, hmm. Cleo uh, and Professor uh, Minnatullah hmm. from Bangladesh and others uh, would also like to join in this conversation. Without much ado, I would now like to uh, kick off this conversation for today. Ambassador Franz Paris, would you like to initiate the discussion? Franz. Thanks. Thanks a lot for, for, for inviting all of us to that uh, discussion and uh, it's a privilege to be with so distinguished and, and, and very competent uh, colleagues from all around the world to discuss the importance of, of, uh, of the Stockholm uh, conference in 72. Would you like me just to make a few comments generally on Yeah, on yeah generally, generally. I think, I think 72 was really, that was really um, the first global conference on the human environment. And it was really a, a critical conference that brought uh, the environment to the attention of the global community. Stockholm cannot be underestimated. Um, first of all, as you mentioned already, it led to the foundation of UNEP, the uh, uh, United Nations Environment Program. But in the lead up to Stockholm, also many nations created their national environmental ministries. Many countries didn't have environmental ministries before. 
And um, Stockholm owns also created an ascent right to a quality environment, the right to a clean, to a healthy environment, combined with the responsibility to protect. And he brought together already the different dimension of sustained development, uh, a healthy environment, a clean environment, but also development and social concerns were brought together. The concept of future generation uh, was, was, was uh, launched and the concept of consumption production patterns to look at them in a manner that helps all of us from an environmental but also from a social perspective. So Stockholm cannot be underestimated and uh, I really hope that this year will be more than only an anniversary of Stockholm, more than only an anniversary of the, of the creation of UNEP, but that it will also be a moment where we build on what has been created in Stockholm and continue to work together to further strengthen the international regime for the benefit for all of us, of all of us. Thank you very much, Franz, Ambassador Franz Paris, for your uh, setting the tone of this uh, conversation uh, today. I would now ask hmm, my distinguished friend, Felix Dodd, Professor Felix, you have seen a lot of ups and downs hmm, in the last uh, 40 years or so. Hmm, so what is your take? How do you uh, evaluate? Hmm. And I know you are also hmm, very uh, familiar with uh, Maurice Strong, who was one of the architect of, uh, say, Stockholm Conference. And uh, from then uh, onwards, but today we miss Bryce Lalonde, who was another pillar of this process, but his health condition is not good, so he couldn't join today. Felix. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, just to add a couple of uh, comments to Franz's very good overview of Stockholm. One of the the only other head of state who attended Stockholm um, was the Indira Gandhi. And I think she played a critical role in ensuring that poverty was part of the agenda from the beginning. And I think that's an important thing to, to remember. And in fact, I think um, maybe others will uh, have more uh, view on this, but I think that the Stockholm conference was the first time that climate change appeared in a UN document. And, and as should be the case, it asked for uh, ensuring that science uh, of climate change was pursued before you could take any uh, policy decisions. And I think that one of the important roles that uh, UNEP has played over this period of time since um, Stockholm has been to build a science base and to be at the beginning of the process for the setting up of the IPCC, for the uh, setting up of IPBES, and now at this upcoming UN Environment Assembly, the setting up of the uh, equivalent for chemicals and waste. That science base then gives us the possibility to have the right policies based on, uh, on that. And I would just say that, you know, I, I'm a huge supporter of what Morris did, but to some extent, it was Mustafa who did a lot of the hard work in the period um, after Morris left as an executive director. And if you look at particularly his work on climate change, particularly his work on biodiversity, but of course, uh, the gem is the work that he did with the Vienna Convention on ozone depleting chemicals and uh, the Montreal Protocol. UNEP has played this critical role in creating the ecosystem of multilateral environmental agreements that we see today. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, uh, for mentioning that uh, UNEP hmm, had set the hmm, agenda you know, for other uh, conventions, uh, creation of other bodies uh, on environment front, climate change, desertification, uh, Montreal Protocol, and so on and so forth. They are um, uh, pollution um, and also pollutants. Uh, so uh, it has um, a lot of uh, milestones uh, uh, we have achieved. Uh, Maria Ivanova, Professor Maria Ivanova, you have also written a book on, uh, uh, say, um, achievement uh, of uh, this uh, prime institution 
our own environment. Uh, so what is your take? How do you hmm, uh, see uh, the evolution and uh, the uh, functioning of uh, United Nations environment program and its success, achievements and challenges? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I am a student of UNEP, a scholar of UNEP, a partner of UNEP. I have been studying the organization for many, many years, engaging with it and uh, bringing the people who imagined the institution, who also led it over the years, and those who are going to take over. Indeed, in, uh, in 2009, with Ambassador Franz Pere, we convened for the first and only time all of UNEP's executive directors. At the time, yeah. there were five, and uh, they will not come together again because that was Mara Strong, Mustafa Toba, Elizabeth Dowdswell, Klaus Topfer, and Achim Steiner. But we also brought the people who had been working in the United States, in uh, Malta, in other countries to create the institution. Ambassador John McDonald, for example, who led the United States and its role at, in the Stockholm Conference. And we also had the people who led the organization and a set of or a group of young people, emerging leaders, who now are leading great organizations. So thinking, in, learning from the past, in learning from the present and imagining the future. But as a scholar of UNEP, I have written indeed, unfortunately, the only academic book on UNEP. The World Bank has over a hundred books. Uh, WTO, the World Trade Organization has over a hundred books. UNEP now has yeah. one academic book. Only one, yeah. Only one academic book. It is, it is this one, the untold story no. of the UN, of the world's leading environmental institution, UNEP and 50, at 50. And I will just summarize the achievements of UNEP in three, in three sets, building on what was said so far. One, UNEP put the environment on the agenda. It put the environment on the global agenda, but it also created the environmental ministries and put it on the national agendas of countries around the world. Second, UNEP created the ecosystem indeed, as Felix was saying, of international environmental law. And uh, third, UNEP did resolve one of the key global environmental issues, and that was the depletion of the ozone layer. Why and how that was done, we can discuss that, but the role of Mustafa Toba as a leader and of UNEP as the leading institution was absolutely critical. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Maria, uh, for your uh, reflection, especially touching uh, some key issues uh, on uh, environment front, uh, which uh, or are uh, possible because of the creation of United Nations Environment Program Unit. Uh, I would now like to ask uh, Mazharul Alam, who is in Bangkok office of uh, regional office of United Nations Environment Program. Uh, Mazharul Alam uh, has also <coughs> been uh, in the process of climate change negotiation, uh, climate adaptation, and um, other uh, streams uh, in not only in Bangladesh but also Asia, Asia Pacific regions um, for a couple of decades. So, Babu, uh, Mazhar Alam, uh, can you um, say come up with um, the achievements of UNEF uh, and also challenges you are facing? Um, Um, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kamburvai, for um, inviting UNEP in this very important discussion. And Ambassador Franz, uh, Maria, and Felix, they have also talked about um, the achievement of the UNEP. And thank you, Maria, hearing that this is the first book you have written yeah. uh, on UNEP and, and the ecosystem that UNEP has provided to bring the environment agenda uh, and uh, as a part of the global agenda, but also bringing environment as a part of the development agenda. 
It is not the environment for the environment's sake, but it is also supporting the development. Uh, many achievement has already been talked, but I'd like to just highlight probably um, just adding what Maria has mentioned about um, uh, the, the convention to protect the ozone layer by uh, controlling uh, the ozone depleting substances. Um, if we look into the, the current state, uh, almost 99% of the ozone depleting substances has been uh, controlled now. And what we have achieved through that is almost every year, 2 million, the skin cancer that the pupil has to have if we uh, fail to control that. So that is, is the part of the, the human environment and supporting the development. Uh, the second one I would like to also mention um, in terms of the leaded petrol that we used to use in the car. And that was a huge problem um, as a part of our development. And then that is almost coming to an end. Um, we are almost going to see the success of completely um, not using the leaded petrol in, in the car. Uh, what we are still facing, though UNEP able to bring the environment in the global agenda, setting the ministries in the every countries, but our executive director has um, identified the three planetary crises that, that we are still facing and it's going to face unless we are able to uh, manage it. One is the climate crisis. The second is the biodiversity crisis. And the third is the pollution crisis. So the challenge remain on us and we need to work together. Thank you, uh, Master Alam. Uh, I would now like to uh, go to Cleo mm, Oliver. Uh, your take, how do you see? Mm. First, uh, I would like to thank for inviting me to join this very important discussion about our environment. This is my first time to join this uh, group and I am honored to be part of this one. I am connected in the private sector. My, I, uh, in, my, in my company, I am the head of environment, environmental compliance of Robinson's Land Corporation, a real estate company. And we are mandated by the government to do the to submit the sustainability report all year round. And we are managing our, in, our environmental compliance that economic development progressively will go hand in hand with our environment in, uh, protection of the environment. I am also the national president of the organization of mechanical engineers in the Philippines. And we are, we are involved in the design of in machine, machineries that produce those greenhouse gases. And we have part of our advocacy in our program to, to, have, to, to protect the environment. So we have a part of our program on the GHG emissions. And this is, uh, and uh, I, I would like it to, we can be part of our of our engineer mechanical. We can be we can have we can have uh, uh, join this advocacy. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I uh, ask a bit of hmm. bit of, Can you join hmm, and share your reflection? Hmm. Bit of from Nairobi. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, African perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me again to this uh, conversation. Uh, just to mention that I'm originally from Malawi and I'm here in Nairobi uh, working for the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. Uh, and I've also taken my time to study for my PhD uh, with the University of Nairobi and the um, uh, focusing on the Paris Agreement differentiation in as far as how uh, the least developed countries in Africa are reacting, um, focusing on the climate politics. Uh, so that, that is my study of specialization. Uh, but I also want to reflect on the subject matter that is at hand today, 
uh, in as far as the uh, UNEP history is concerned. But most importantly, uh, what, what has it done to Africa in particular? Uh, I think one thing that he, um, coming from, most, from, from the least evolved countries, I note that he, there's quite a lot of uh, capacity building that has come from uh, uh, UNEP as supporting uh, uh, least developed countries in terms of how they look at issues of climate change and also how they can deal with adaptation. Uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the different studies that UNEP has been able to carry out and those studies have been able to help at least developed countries, especially uh, in the negotiations. So we know, for example, uh, the various gap reports that UNEP produces and it has been a tremendous resource helping least developed countries in negotiations, but also in terms of programming uh, at country level. Uh, as, as governments, we've also been looking for uh, to UNEP uh, for various support uh, in terms of how we can uh, carry out our work. Uh, and I think um, uh, the, the, the placement of UNEP in Africa is also very symbolic. I think it is something that was also uh, enabled uh, uh, African governments to be able to look at the, at the whole uh, multilateral process around the environment to be really an equal space because I think this is the biggest institution and it is uh, housed in Africa and I think uh, it is something that also in a one way or the other gives pride to the African nation uh, but also maybe in particular uh, to uh, the country where I am um, and Nairobi where UNEP is also. So those are my few reflections and thank you very much for inviting me. I wish to make this forum my regular uh, space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... I would now like to request Christopher. Hmm. Christopher. Christopher, can you share your tape? Christopher. Oh, you're muted. Now, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, Christopher. Excellent. Well, I would like, first of all, uh, to thank for the invitation and um, claim that I'm, I'm really honoured to be a part of this discussion uh, now. I'm um, a climate scientist working at the Meteorological uh, Office of uh, Sweden and working a lot with IPCC. Um, I, I'm, well, I was not in um, Stockholm in 1972 because this was before I was born. Uh, but I can pretty well clearly see the consequences of um, what's been built. However, I have to say that um, I'm also critical to the fact that it hasn't gone through as much as what we would have hoped it could have done. I mean, uh, in 1972, you have uh, Stockholm and the start of UNEP. Um, you have also the Club of Rome, um, roughly. <laughs> At the same time, and the Meadows reports. In the 1990s, you have the first IPCC. And since the 90s, we see that uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been larger than all of the um, greenhouse emissions from 90, well, 1850 until 1990. So my concern is whether young generations can actually see and understand the impact of the Stockholm uh, conference when they don't really see the impacts on their present day and, and future life. So that would be my perspective. Uh, thank you, uh, Christopher. Professor Abdullah Shibli. Shibli thank you. Thank you, Kamrol. Thank you, climate. Um, channel and Shanjoy for organizing this um, meeting. I am glad that I could join you. And I'm also very happy to note that we have participants from different parts of the world. Boston, as you know, had three feet almost of snow yesterday and I was home. But it feels good to know that we have participants from the Philippines, from Africa. I, I'm sorry if I forget whether 
Vidu was from Nigeria, um, but um, is it from Nigeria? Malawi. Oh, Malawi, oh, my favorite country. <laughs> um, and um, also other parts of the globe. So I am from Bangladesh, but mm. for the last 40 years or more, I have lived in Boston and have enjoyed the cooler environment. So global, um, I guess climate change and uh, global warming, if you can want to still use it, has been on my mind because my country, Bangladesh, has been struggling with adaptation, mitigation, all the other measures. So Kamrul and his team are, I would say, forward looking in terms of getting or raising the global consciousness. And I have been writing a lot about these issues. Uh, my forum is the Bangladesh's number one newspaper, uh, English language newspaper, the Daily Star, where I have the privilege of writing a column. And while I cannot write on climate change on every um, issue, on every issue, in every issue, I try to bring out the economic issues because I am an economist. And then I have worked on environmental economics. So I see the uh, positive and the negative side of every measure. As you know, in the USA, which is supposed to be the biggest, um, I guess, engine of change for funding uh, the different climate measures for um, leading uh, in terms of what measures can be taken, how to um, reduce emissions and not only emission, but also bringing about uh, various adaptation measures, the research and the, and the funding. Uh, so I keep a track of that and I hope that I will be able to lend my voice to um, this discussion from the American side as also, as also making folks aware of the interest of the developing countries, especially okay. on loss and... Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Simplify, I will come back to you again. Uh, meanwhile, would I uh, go to Khaja Minnatullah, who has been in this process for many months, uh, especially on uh, waterfront, water sanitation, hmm. Uh, pollution, mm, environment uh, in general. Uh, for many years, he has been uh, on the forefront, especially at the grassroots level, at the national level, even at the mm, international level. Minnat Bhai. Thank you very much, Kamrul, for having me. And uh, this is indeed a great <coughs> pleasure and privilege for me to be able to uh, meet uh, such an august gathering. Um, I have always been uh, one of the uh, appreciator of Kamrul's uh, uh, tremendous efforts of uh, networking uh, amongst the uh, practitioners and, uh, and uh, um, academics and researchers in the area of uh, environment and climate change. Uh, I wouldn't, for my first participation and presence, as I said, I very much appreciate this. And I do keep following Kamru's all other sessions that he has. Stuck me uh, uh, in today's uh, discussions that we ha I have heard so far, uh, quietly and silently laid the foundation of the global environmental issues that we are uh, challenged today. Even I would say that uh, some of the areas that UNEP uh, worked in the last many years uh, has probably helped us in kind of uh, meeting the challenge of the current pandemic. 
uh, as you perhaps know that the climate over a cycle of 10,000 years, maybe the last one was 10,000 years back. Pandemics occur maybe over a uh, cycle of 100 to 200 years. So the, uh, the, the achievements that we have seen so far by laying the foundation of a global climate challenges, uh, which has been picked up by various uh, agencies, including United Nations agencies um, uh, and uh, multi uh, international financing agencies of which I have worked with the World Bank for the last 30 years. And my main thrust was uh, on uh, the uh, environmental health and of late uh, climate change. And uh, in these areas, I think I will conclude by saying that uh, needs to be you know, uh, uh, much more kind of uh, uh, strengthened. The, the networking and the continuous kind of uh, sharing of ideas and knowledge and then pursuing the agenda of global climate change through the efforts of United Nations Environment Program and other United Nations agencies is now uh, going to uh, jump because you might have noticed that we are almost failing to achieve temperature uh, rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade within another 20, 30 years. We are almost failing that. So uh, what I keep telling Kamal in uh, other forums is that we have to start walking the talk. And these kind of forums through private participations and communities and, and uh, uh, experts, professors, and intellectuals, I think this should expand. And if these platforms and similar platforms expands globally, I think we can uh, we can form a very effective instrument to could put pressure uh, peer pressure on the policymakers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you are absolutely right, uh, Minat Bhai. You know, we should uh, involve the private sector because private sector is the engine of the growth. So um, we have to involve them uh, so that they can um, have uh, development agenda setting um, uh, with. Uh, climate is smart one, development is smart one, green growth one, and also environment friendly one. Can I ask uh, 6.1? Can you introduce yourself and join us? You mean Gleb, Gleb Romanovsky. Uh right? Yeah. Um, okay. Just oh, Gleb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Gleb. Yes, I, I can hear yeah. you. Just, uh, um, yeah. First of all, I would like to say sorry for some difficulties in connection and with my personal uh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes, because uh, sometimes it works completely unpredictable. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I would like to Thank you for mm. Mm. Mm, for this meeting, for the discussion, and um, yes, just l let me introduce myself because I'm new here, right? Um, my name is uh, Gleb Romanovsky, I'm from Moscow, I'm working in the field of urban and transport development. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's very complicated because... Um, <laughs> okay, I I'll come back to you again. Uh, I'll come back to you again. Ambassador Franz Paris. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. How goes? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Hmm. So now, hmm, what are the key challenges now we are confronting, which should be handled by UNEF, uh, say, next 10 years, 20 years? We know that. Uh, UNEF had a flagship document, uh, say, Global Environment Outlook. Yeah. So how it can enrich that CEO, uh, we have been in this process for many months, many years, how to improve that qualitatively, quantitatively, and also say on various sectors, 
from ecosystem to biodiversity, from climate change to uh, say fossil fuel, uh, from say Montreal Protocol uh, to uh, say pollutants, dirty dozens, <clears throat> mercuries, okay. all those say, from Rotterdam Convention to Ramsar. So wide spectrum. Hmm. Yes, there are different institutions, but as uh, UNEF is the key institution in the mm, field of environment in general, sustainable development, how we can strengthen that, empower that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think you're absolutely right. You do not only have to look backwards and celebrate, but also look forward <laughs> and what is needed. And it was said already before, I, I think, um, uh, by Felix and by Maria, I think one of the key functions of UNEP is, of course, the scientific functions. UNEP was provided, was established to provide the scientific information that is needed to take the right policy decisions. I think that is one of the key functions that UNEP really has to continue to play and to strengthen. And you're referring right to a GEO, GEO to the Global and Outlook, that's a key deliverer of UNEP, but also the emissions gap report, the, the NDC gap report, or uh, adaptation. These are critical documents to be delivered. But I think it's also important that UNEP continues to strengthen that pillar. Felix was referring to the science policy panel uh, for chemicals and waste cluster. That's a proposal submitted by Switzerland and supported by a number of countries for the next UNEAR. And we really think this panel should be established to strengthen further the scientific base. But then there are also some uh, new and emerging issues, new issues which you do not fully understand, like uh, geoengineering, solar radiation management, uh, climate altering technologies and measures. And we sincerely believe that also UNEP should engage in assessing the risks and the potential of such uh, technologies in order to provide information needed for wise decision making. But UNEP does have more than a scientific function. It also has a, a function of providing overarching policy guidance. And that is also important. So that UNEAR comes together and gives guidance what should be the next steps, for example, regard to mineral resource extractions, another decision that UNEAR will look at, or on sustainable infrastructure, or generally on chemicals and waste policy. UNEAR has to play that uh, function to provide overarching policy guidance and thereby also to make sure that the individual decision taken in the deed will MEAs. Uh, together makes sense. So it has also to provide for synergies between the different uh, thematic areas of the environment. And thirdly, last but not least, uh, least UNEP has also to further continue the scientific information action on the that ground. is needed. UNEP is not an implementing right. right. policy. UNEP does not have the expertise and knowledge one of the key to, to, to implement the project really on the ground has to continue but to play it and to and such such activities with jails. Geo to the global and and is also key also of UNEP because also also the have all the three things together, the science, the policy, and implementation. These are critical documents to be But I think it's also important that UNEP continues to strengthen that yeah. Felix science was referring to the science and policy and panel uh, uh, for chemicals and waste plastics. So that's a proposal uh, submitted by Switzerland and, and supported by a number of countries before the next UNEAR. And we uh, really think this panel should yes, establish to strengthen further the scientific to base. So then there are also some uh, new and yeah, emerging uh, issues, uh, new issues can, uh, which we don't fully understand, ideas. like uh, yeah, geoengineering. So, <laughs> So I think there are a couple of things that, I mean, I would agree with everything that Franz has said. I think that there are a couple of other areas that um, are important. One is the role that um, UNEP Finance Initiative has played in the green economy and doing the principles for responsible investment, the principles for responsible banking and responsible insurance. And the work they've done with Mark Carney on the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. I think that's an extremely important area for UNIT to be involved in. I think the work of uh, European countries to, in particular, to move forward the discussion on uh, the circular economy fits into that area as well. And, the new potential plastics convention, well, I think, and Franz can correct me if I'm wrong, be the first one which will put the idea of the circular economy into a legally binding convention. So I think that's really important. And there are gaps like the plastics 
um, where there is an opportunity to develop a new legally binding agreement. And if you look at the resolutions in front of UNEP, potentially down the road, there's another one on mining. The approach seems to be very similar to what they did uh, in chemicals. The um, issue on new technology, my latest book in the backdrop is of my latest book, is um, new te uh, Tomorrow's People and New Technology, looking at 2030 and how those new technologies will help deliver uh, the SDGs in Paris, but there are also big challenges on governance, again what Franz talked about and what in fact Jan's, uh, Janus Pastor has just written about, um, I think a couple of days ago and I've just put up on my blog, we need to be able to deal with the challenges of that. And then I guess um, around the programme of work that we have, we've never really utilised the possibility of stakeholders coming together to help UNEP to deliver that program of work. And I think there's a, a gap in an ability as they're starting, as they're doing around the sustainable development goals um, generally to really build a much stronger community of implementers on the ground with uh, coalitions of uh, the willing around those. And finally, my okay. challenge is to, is to, I've got one more thing to say. My challenge to um, Francis, if we are having UNEA in 2022, as we are now, the next logical one will be two years from now in 2024. We will have missed a significant opportunity to input to the midterm review of the SDGs. And perhaps Switzerland would like to host a ministerial uh, like we used to have uh, in the alternate years to ensure that UNEP and the environment ministries have a good opportunity to input to uh, the SDG review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claudia. Yes. Claudia, can you hear me? Claudia, Claudia, listen. Yes, thank you. Well, um, I was working in, in the government from Mexico, but I only on the item of dust and waste. Um, for example, we use the, the index of the unit of food waste, no? But I think that for, for us, our problem is um, I think that the industries, they are always uh, with some advantage, uh, a difference that the government, I think that the implementation for us is the difficulty for, for example, to, to have a, a real strategy of food loss and waste. And I think that the reason is the, the, the society, they have the, the idea that they could have a change if, if you don't uh, waste uh, food, but they don't have the idea that it, it could be a little part of the change for the climate change. I think that sometimes is, is the problem. They could be the, 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 uh, a real good result to have a good implementation, but I think that we don't have a, a real good communication with all the, the steps of the change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bito Sinuko, in a minute. Bito. Bito Sinuko from Malawi, from Nairobi. Yeah. I'm in a meeting. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the things that we, uh, I would want to reflect on in under minute, I'm sorry for that, my daughter just walked into my room, um, is that uh, I think we need to, uh, going forward, to uh, look at how, for example, we can match out the, uh, the ambition that was set for UNEP with the uh, escalating challenges. Uh, we see that the climate is not the same from the time when it was set, so how can we match uh, where the climate is, where the crisis is reached. Uh, I think we need to have a critical look at the institution. We need to look at the deliverables that we need to achieve and match it with the challenge of climate change uh, where, where it has gotten uh, to. I think any institution that doesn't reflect, uh, it can actually easily become redundant. I'm not thinking that UNEP can do that, but it just makes common sense that I think we just need to look at uh, where, where we started and where we are, whether we're still relevant. I know to a greater extent we are, but it still begs a uh, uh, reflection. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vito. Uh, Cleo Oliver Marceda from the Philippines. Yeah. My country is most affected if there is 
an impact of climate change. We the the, the most uh, the strongest typhoon we call that Yolanda uh, that hit in my in my hometown. So many people were killed. Was uh, it, it was the first time that uh, it happened in my lifetime. So many people died along along in in in, in everywhere. I'm, I'm connected in Robinson's Land Corporation and one of our mall in Robinson's Tacloban was totally damaged. So it is not only, it's not only the government, but also we as individual that we have to do something to have to okay. protect our environment. In, in, in the private sector, we have to comply the regulation. We have to meet the standards that we have to, to achieve those uh, sustainable development goals. Thank you. Uh, Professor Maria Ivanova, hmm. you are an authority. You have written a book on uh, United Nations Environment Program. So this is your turn hmm. to reflect. Let me just put a few strands together here because UNEP was created and currently is the only institution with the formal mandate to bring the two, the 3000 piece puzzle together and look at it from 30,000 feet up. There is no other institution in the United Nations who has the formal mandate on the environment. Yes, we have all of the different legal institutions. We have development institutions that do parts of the environment, but it is the United Nations Environment Program that has the mandate to have the scientific knowledge on the environment, to develop policies on the environment, to provide support on the environment and to catalyze action to implement. And so oh. UNEA, the UN Environment Assembly that is coming up in a few uh, days, literally, is the place where this can be, can be implemented, where UNEP actually can take the role of a leader in the global environmental agenda and help us to see the 3,000 foot the 3,000 piece puzzle from 30,000 feet up. Thank you. Uh, Mazahul Alam, you are uh, sitting at UNEF regional office in Bangkok. So how um, do you Thank you, you very much. Um, as I mentioned, let me, uh, let me start from my last point, the, the three, the planetary crisis that we have identified. One is the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the pollution crisis. And then we have also heard from the different colleagues that what UNEPs need to focus on, which is obviously um, the science to support the policy and the policy to, to implement the action on the ground. I think, I think that is what UNEP is doing and will continue to do. Just I'd like to end by saying that if we look into the problem, particularly the climate change, the solution lies with the G20 countries because they are almost the 80% uh, share the global greenhouse gas emission. So if we really would like to keep the temperature below two degree or aspiring for the 1.5 degree, the G20 nations are the, the solution to provide. And, and UNEP will be continuously pursuing that through the emission gap report, will be pursuing through the adaptation gap report, as well as we'll be pursuing that agenda through the production gap report, which is the new, but many of you have heard that. And if we look into the amount of the investment already locked in, in terms of the fossil fuel industry, it is 110% more if we compare with the 1.5 degree. So you also need to look into what the Glasgow Climate Action talked about, the fossil fuel subsidy and the phase down or the phase out of the coal. We need to continuously work on that. Yeah, phase out or phase down, that debate will continue. Uh, Mazhar Alam Babu, uh, Christopher. 
you know one or two sentences you take now yes uh, i just shared a link between uh, because i saw that the swedish um, environment ministry is organizing a stockholm plus 50 conference uh, which is worth mentioning in this um, sense i think that um, well based on my own professional experience um, science information especially climate science information is uh, fundamental to all the other objectives that uh, were, were discussed because without raising awareness of uh, populations of stakeholders uh, and of governors uh, well um, decision makers uh, changes won't be um, able to to happen and uh, I from from the IPCC side I see that we have many common uh, issues and, and, and um, many common documents linking together the climate, mitigation, adaptation, the SDGs, the pollution, um, but maybe if an even more efficient co collaboration between IPCC, IPBES and UNEP in the communication efforts, uh, that could lead to a really strong um, impact effect on, on, on um, our public and using the momentum of the second IPCC report that will be um, published at the end of February and third and the synthesis report coming later um, that would be a good opportunity for UNEP to display all the amounts of reports and knowledge and proclamations that are already present, but maybe not as easily understood by the broader public. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christophe. Uh, Gleb, hmm. Gleb Romanovsky, are you with us? Yes, you are yeah. with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, what, what I, I would like to say, if you speak about, uh, if you speak about environmental issues, right, and I would like to answer from the point of view of an urban planner, uh, point of view of a person who deals a lot with uh, cities, transport infrastructure, economic development, and etc. I think that in order to tackle environmental issues, we have to collaborate at the level of region, maybe, and it also will depend on the region because all regions have different problems and as a result, yeah. different aims. Yeah. And how to say, if we consider environmental issues as problems caused by the way a system works, I mean, system in general, system of cities, system of we behave, the system of how we react, act, how we plan and solve problems. Um, in this case, it should work from general things to particular ones, right? From politics and policies of collaboration of regions. For example, it could be Scandinavia, it could be Southeast Asia, and etc. In order to change our point of view on the way we plan cities and how we plan our infrastructure in order to develop develop economics and uh, sorry economy and um, how we plan the way we live and as a result um, how we increase the quality of environment or we decrease it okay. and. In this case, acting from global things to more local, I think we can we can uh, achieve our goal because uh, if we speak about post-Soviet states, maybe it is very huge <laughs> region to speak about. In this case, changes come really, really slow. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abdullah Shibli, Dr. Shibli.
शिवली भाई अरे यू इतस हाँ जमीन ना तुल्ला Thank okay. you very much. Uh, I I lost contact for a while. I just wondered whether you okay. can uh, yeah. hear me right now. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Franz Paris. Your closing comment. My my closing point is that, uh, and then building on what Maria Ivanova was always saying her, through her research, is that the mandate of UNEP has a strong mandate. Uh, and the closing point is, well, let's use that mandate. Let's build on that mandate. I fully agree with Felix. It's not enough just to wait for two more years for the next UNIA. Uh, but I would uh, suggest and invite the African group who is now having the lead uh, over UNIA to make sure that next UNIA will be already next year so that we can give the needed guidance, uh, the needed policy guidance and take the needed decisions. So the mandate is right, but it is our task now to use it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. It was a great pleasure uh, to have you all and share your take uh, at this uh, Climate Channel, Climate Conversation, uh, episode 61 with Kamrul Sodri. Uh, Climate Kamrul. Channel is, please, uh, yeah. I, okay. I, yeah. I'm sorry to interject here, but I have to say something because a lot of the speakers said REUNIP is producing reports and we're doing reports and we, we have the, the GEO report and a new report and a new report. I have to say on behalf of the young people who are in the streets, who have been in the streets and who have been pushing for more action, reports are not enough. And right. UNEP, it is time for UNEP to do something more than reports, but UNEP cannot do it by itself. And so right. this is my call for UNEP to partner with academia to go beyond reports, to go into the classroom and change the conversation. We need to change the conversation politically and societally. And UNEP has a power, has the power to do that, but it needs to do it. Thank you very, very much, Professor Maria Ivanova. Hopefully in our next episode, episode 62nd, uh, next Saturday, we are going to discuss that. And hopefully some of you will be over there to share your reflection and try to have your take on what UNEF can do, can deliver, in the coming years, coming 50 years, coming 30 years or 20 years down the lane. Mm -hmm. With that optimism, with that hope, Mazhar uh, Alam, thank you for, <laughs> and uh, of thank course, you very uh, much for, yeah, for, uh, for inviting uh, and thank you very much Alex for organizing others, this, yeah. the conversation on UNEP and, and all inputs are appreciated. Thank you very, very much. Pass. With that is ending here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kamral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good time with each other.